Stevenage and Alex Ravel. Uh, we're down to League Two for this one. Stevenage, of course, escaped relegation uh, due to the uh, sad demise of Macclesfield. But on the follow-up season, despite them going off as the favourites for relegation, or joint favourites for relegation, I think it was in the end, with Morecambe, look how that ended, uh, they are performing above expectations under Ravel. And he has guided them to a, a mid-table finish. You know, they, they were really tough to beat this season, Stephen Inch. They picked up some really notable results, which isn't bad, Mike, for a manager who, you know, is only late 30s. Yeah, well, it took it, you know, it, it, it was a, a bit of a baptism of fire at the beginning of the season in the sense that, you know, they they were sort of back in the position. They kind of almost changed the entire squad. There was a lot of turnover last summer. And you're just thinking, right, it's a completely new identity of a team, a completely new profile. So don't b- latch on the previous season. But it, it was almost like the legacy continued at the beginning of the season and they were, you know, bottom of the table after a while. Um, but then I think that I think the the key moment was bringing in Dean Wilkins because I think Alex Ravel has been very conscious from the outset about his own lack of experience in managerial terms. This is a player with huge, huge experience as a player at League One and League Two level. We're talking six hundred senior senior appearances or so, seven or eight different clubs that he's you know represented with distinction, and so there's no shortage of experience on the football side. But in terms of putting a team together and, and, you know, managing it, and I think the the introduction of Dean Wilkins midway through the season was a big, big turning point. And from that point forward, you know, there was kind of no looking back. Uh, And then we began began to see what was kind of just always there. You know, like, I don't think an awful lot changed in terms of the attitude of the players and the application, but it just suddenly fell into place with the right chemistry after Wilkins kind of guided Ravel in the right direction on on that score. It does feel like a trend that we are um, seeing more and more in the Football League. And we've talked about it on the podcast as well. You know, we on the Mark Bonner podcast, which you can go back and listen to, uh, we covered the fact that he brought in Gary Waddock to work alongside him. He identified that he needed some assistance as well and some experience alongside him. Uh, we talked about Neil Critchley as well. We brought in Colin Calderwood. Well, I, say, I talked about Neil Critchley, Mike. Uh, you listened on that occasion. Uh, Colin Calderwood alongside him. Um so experience is key, but then also we talked mentioned at the top of the show, Matty Taylor in at Walsall. You know, he's got Neil McDonald alongside him, and they've put in a director of football in the shape of Jamie Fullerton. It does seem that now at League Two, more than any other division, we're seeing owners and chairmen put in place teams, you know, a head coach who may not have been a big name, but is guided by the experience, and then you know, potentially a director of football as well, but putting in these blocks in place to make sure that the team are able to work together and it's not just all falling on one manager. And that seems to be the direction that Stevenage are able to go in. Yeah, definitely. And, and I think it's also worth pointing out as well that compatibility is a big issue here because, I mean, we're talking about before Dean Wilkins arriving, you know, Stevenage brought in Lenny Lawrence and we saw the effect that Lenny Lawrence had guiding Michael Flynn. But initially it wasn't working with Alex Ravel, you know, and, and, and Ravel was struggling despite having Lenny Lawrence to call upon there. Russell Slade's also acting as a consultant for Stevenage, one of his former managers, you know. Yet still uh, in the beginning, Ravel was really struggling to, to get results. I, th- I think it was more results than performances. Um, and then it was Dean Wilkins. And I think there's a com- probably a compatibility between Dean Wilkins and Alex Ravel. The, a synergy that works a lot better. And I think Wilkins is just more hands-on on the training ground compared to, you know, we're talking about Slade as a consultant, Lenny Lawrence sort of in a boardroom capacity or something. Uh, Wilkins came in and was a lot more hands-on and it was about systems and formations initially, I believe. So compatibility is a big thing. It's about getting the right man that, that, that compensates for the blind spot of, you know, what might be missing Um of you know in the manager himself so yeah there's definitely a trend towards that in recent managers it's interesting you mentioned Mark Bonner as well because Mark Bonner and, and Alex Ravel are really good friends both grew up in Cambridge and, and came through the system at Cambridge um, and yes so you know it's yeah it's, that, that's clearly the pattern that's happening a lot more in, in League 2 now and is it important then to let managers pick their you know assistants rather than have one thrust upon them because of the compatibility issue um, maybe a little bit of mix of both. In I mean, w- we talked about Mark Bonner, and it, it, it was it was 
to Mark Bonner's credit that he was the guy that wanted uh, Gary Waddock to come in, having never worked with him before, having known nothing about him, knowing he had the CV to step into his shoes if it didn't go well. With Alex Ravel, he worked previously with Dean Wilkins. The motivation behind this was Dean Wilkins had only ever had one managerial job previously. Two years in charge of Brighton, managing Alex Ravel as one of his main players in that team. And he was aware, having been out of the game since 2008, that 70% of managers never get a second job after the first one. And he didn't want Alex Ravel to go the same way. So he's like, they, they, they both... They both share this same emotional decision-making function and there's clearly a connection, a, a, a close connection between the pair of them. And it's a big motivation for Wilkins to not see Ravel go that way. And, you know, sometimes you just need a leg up in your first job to get up and running and get going. And it's like, I liken this to, it's almost like, you know, management sometimes is a knack. There's a knack to certain things about the job that's, you know, we all think we know it in theory and what it entails. And you can play 600 games like Alex Ravel, but sometimes there's a knack. It's like putting a, you know, somebody gives you a bunch of keys and you know which key to put in the lock, but there's a knack where, you know, somebody shows you have to pull the door and then turn the key. And then all of a sudden it's like, well, why didn't you say that? Now I know this, I'm fine. And there's all these little tricks of the trade that sometimes you don't necessarily get. And that's what I think what Dean Wilkins has done for Alex Ravel. And now it's like we're seeing an almost totally different manager post Wilkins to what we saw before. But there's no threat there of Wilkins ever really stepping into his shoes. I think Alex Ravel's very much the main man. The players are firmly behind him. And now it's kind of, you know, he's ready to move forward now, having having got through those teething troubles. And what's interesting is Ravel has, has said, well, you know, in terms of my playing career, I could have gone on. You know, he says I could still run and I could still score goals but I chose to go into coaching when, when the opportunity came, it was a no brainer, you know, to come and manage Stevenage. So, you know, this is a man who has, I guess, put his cards on the table and said, yeah, this is the direction I want to go in. And I guess on his part as well, it was always a bit of a gamble. Yeah. And it doesn't surprise me that he thinks he could have kept playing because he's a very in the moment, very, you know, he was a like if his, his physique as a player, his ability to run the channels and everything that he used to do. He's a very energetic player. And, you know, this is a part of his personality, a big part of his personality. Very adrenaline-focused, very in the moment, never gets carried away looking too far ahead into the future or too far back. And, and, and one of the things we can say is, you look at his past managers, and it's not, it's not a glittering CV of past managers that he's played for. You know, Russell Slade and Dean Wilkins are about two of the biggest names, but there's one name in there that speaks volumes volumes about Ravel as a character, and it's Steve Evans. And he played for Steve Evans for three years, and I don't think many players get to play for Steve Evans for three years and still keep giving what Steve Evans demands for three years. Has the energy levels, never gets tired of Evans' methods, just wants to keep going again, ready for the next Saturday, ready for the next Saturday. And that's Alex Ravel. You know, I think that's that, that's the big telltale sign in his career is three years under Steve Evans. I'd love to know how many players man lasted that long under his managerial style. But you know, it, this is this is this is uh, Ravel, uh, his character, his personality. It's it, you know, it's very in the moment, very very comfortable with high stakes, comfortable with adrenaline, all those kinds of things. Yeah, and also as well, I mean, I think that the number you, you're looking at there, Mike, will be single figures in players that have lasted that long than Evans got the passion got the you know got the the footballing intelligence i guess as well that that was evident throughout his playing career but also knows this club you know knows the local area and regularly speaks about putting this club back into the community so there's that aspect as well which you know must be pleasing for the fans yeah absolutely and i think i think you know hard work and desire are probably the two biggest words that ravel uses in his post match press conferences and, you know, he's very proud towards the end of the season. You could tell proud that they put a desire back in, you know, they put so much desire back in that they put pride back into the badge and the shirt because it's been a really difficult period, you know, and certainly last season was a bit of a disaster. Um, the season before when they should have been relegated, but for the the, the issues with Macclesfield. Um, so, you know, it, there's a lot of pride there in terms of hard work and desire, but this is very much what he's about. He, he's He tries to be... And I think we might have said this about another manager previously, I'm not sure who, but tries to be the 51% in a relationship. And if you put your faith in people, 
you know, um, it will be repaid in spades. And it's just about being, you know, he comes across as a really nice guy and a, a, a manager that players connect with naturally just as one of their own, you know, they, they I think players could, and particularly at that level, can all see a little bit of themselves in Alex Ravel and know that he's an honest stand-up guy and that, you know, everything he gets is through genuine hard work and you get your rewards. And, and he tries to he tries to make the first step with every player in those relationships. I think I think individually with, with those players behind the scenes, he's gone above and beyond for them before they are being asked to go above and beyond for him. And I think that's the, that's possibly a key dynamic in the relationship with those players. But it's also interesting that he said towards the end of the season that I think, uh, I don't think he wants to do a lot of recruitment. I think it, it was such an arduous process to get this thing moving and get it up and running. He wants to keep it as stable as possible. He wants as much continuity as possible because he feels like, you know, this is something that gains energy with players, the, the goodwill that you get with players. It kind of gains over time. And I think that's where he's at now is that he thinks he can go onwards and upwards with this group of players that he's got. Yeah, he speaks about creating an environment that players want to play in and come and play with a smile on their face. And he also says, as well, going to, back to what you mentioned there, that he says, if you demand from your players early on, you get that respect. And then there's respect from both sides. And interestingly as well, he says regularly, or he said at least two or three times, that he said, he said I'm not really that focused on talent. He said the hard work and the application and the respect all that comes first. And then if that player is good enough and willing to work, then the talent will come out later down the line. An interesting approach because, you know, most managers look first at what a player can produce on the field. But, you know, Alex Ravel looking at traits, looking at character, looking at hard work and ethics here, you know, that is that is a very interesting approach. And it's one that you can actually see in that Stevenage team, the amount of clean sheets that they kept, the amount of wins that they ground out, the amount of times they got pegged back and then went back in front late on and won the game and edged out, you know, really tight games. It it all plays into that, doesn't it? Yeah, I do think I do think he verges more on the emotional side than the than the technical sort of logical side. And yeah, it's you know, like you say, you can see it play out as the season goes on, and you can see it play out in the sense that results weren't good in the first half of the season compared to what they were like in the second half of the season. That faith is being repaid, and it's a, it, it is he's very much about creating a happy working environment. And you know, I think if there's possibly one take he's taken is from his own playing career, and we're talking like I say, six hundred senior appearances, so many different clubs, so many different managers. He played his best football when he was happy. When he was happy day to day in the environment and in his job, that's when his best football came about. And I don't think he ever had a manager that that really, you know, taught him anything innovative in terms of the, the football side. So I think his, his past references aren't necessarily these tactical gurus or anyone that, that's taught him things about the game. You know, this is this is his experience, this is his understanding of football. And it works. Every method works. If it's if the message is consistent and the recruitment it fits into the message and you know everything bonds together and ties together, you know every f- approach of management works. And we've seen it in the case of this season with Stevenage that what started looked as though they were a little bit out of the depth results wise, even though the effort was clearly there in the performance data. Suddenly it all kicks in and you know you you just build on things and that that level of continuity could serve them well again this season because I presume they've learned a hell of a lot about those players as individuals to bring that talent out over the time that they've all been working together. Yeah, and like you say, probably not too much recruitment during the summer. Charlie Carter signed a new contract and Jake Taylor's arrived from Exeter already as well. So already putting building blocks in place. But it it's a long-term appointment, isn't it, with Alex Ravel? I think creating that culture, getting those young players as well. He talks a, a bit about young players and how he wants to teach them what it is to be a footballer. That's something he said in the past. He wants to teach them how to be a footballer. Maybe not how to be a footballer, but what it takes to be a footballer and what it takes to represent a club as well. Um, so clearly putting those building blocks and those foundations in place. And we mentioned the appointment of Wilkins, putting him alongside Ravel. It does all feel like a project, this, doesn't it? A long-term project. You know, that Stephen just got off to a poor start next season. Say they lose the first three or four games. Ravel is not going to be under pressure, you don't you don't feel. No, I don't think so. Certainly not considering you know the way that he was able to weather that storm at the beginning of last season. Uh yeah, and I think 
I think there's a lot to be said for not getting too far ahead of yourself, you know, and and having these long term projects. Or you know, so many players are like being sold this Premier League dream now. We talk about youngsters coming through. There's nothing wrong as a starting point of putting the foundations in place to be a player like Alex Ravel who gets 600 games out of your career at League One and League Two level. If you get them fundamentals right of what it takes to become a, a 600 senior appearance player, then, OK, that's your starting point. Then if the talent is there and, and, and you have got Premier League potential, well, that will come in time. But first and foremost, let's get the fundamentals right. We're talking about young men having careers in football, not just shooting for the stars in the first two or three years, hitting 24, nobody's taking any notice of them, so then they slip out of the game. The, the, I think Stevenage are a club that can build, you know, can, can bring through young men for season careers over long ta- longer time frames just by having them fundamentals in place and not being so obsessed with talent and that, you know, players as commodities as necessarily as well and, and thinking about sell-on value. It's just about building a football club within its community of, of players that, uh, you know, are looking to have long careers and, uh, and get those fundamentals right. And let's face it, as, you know, fans of various clubs, you know, we want more than anything. We like talent, of course we do. You know, we love to see a player who can who can beat a man, who can produce a, a, a bit of skill and fire in from 30 yards. We love a player who can make the difference. But at the end of the day, the majority of fans and, you know, supporters will be back in the stadiums next season want to see players who give 100%, roll up their sleeves, graft, dig in, and occasionally fly into a tackle. You know, it is underappreciated, really, but at the end of the day, fans just want to see players flying the flag for their club and working hard. And under Ravel, you get the feeling that there will be no players shirking any sort of responsibility. Yeah, that's it, absolutely. And at League Two level especially, and I think I think Stevenage is a club now that can benefit from, and I don't want this to sound disparaging, but from just kind of knowing its place and knowing that, that, that you know, if you get those things right, then, you know, an awful lot's not... I think they've had a big scare from nearly going down and being so close to relegation and going out of the league. You know, they've fought, as a club, obviously fought very, very hard to become a football league club. And then it nearly all disappeared in an instant last season. And now they've got a second chance. And I think it's just about understanding you know, what what those underlying values are and, and, and working to them day in, day out and just really understanding what you're about as a football club. And I think I think that's what Stephen and are now next season. They're going to be a club with a real strong identity that doesn't necessarily get too far ahead of itself, but is never going to be dragged back down into that danger zone because of, you know, the, the experiences that they've been through. Maybe not this season coming, but playoffs, are they possible? under Alex Ravel, if the if he continues to get the right working environment, you know, if the players continue to develop and the young players come through and one or two additions here and there, could a top seven finish be possible? Maybe 2022, 23? I don't see why not. I mean, you take away what happened in the second, you you know, you just look at what happened in the second half of the season, Stephen is for a top seven side. So, yeah, there's, if they can replicate that, then absolutely. And I, I wouldn't rule out the potential of this being a journey that leads to promotion, you know, we talk about them understanding that we're a League One club, uh, a League Two club, but even you can still get promotion, behave like a League Two club, not getting ideas above your station in League One, you know? And I think that's that's kind of, that's where I'm getting at with the identity thing with Stevenage, because I do think that it doesn't put a ceiling on you to understand that you can get ideas above your station that stretch you as a club too much, because there's ramifications if you if you do overstretch yourself, you do demand too much of your you know, the size of the club and that what you're capable of doing. I think I think Stevenage are in that place now and they can be very competitive. And you, you look at Newport in a playoff final, for example, you know, Newport and what they've done under Michael Flynn. Still tiny budget and, you know, there's, there's nothing to stop you going into League One and competing in League One when, in essence, you're still a League Two club. So, absolutely, I don't see why, if they, if they can come back, Setting the same standards he set in the second half of last season, maintain it over four to six games. I think they would be in the top seven position. And the shades of Accrington, do you think? We spoke about John Coleman and Accrington a few weeks ago. Um, you know, they 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 always talk about budgets at Accrington. You know, almost got a top six finish this season, but essentially, you know, that is driven out of having that culture at the club and and always punching above your weight. Could the two be compared? Do you think? Possibly. I think Accrington had a benchmark for everybody in that sense, because I think Accrington still 
behave as a League Two club in League One and are competitive now towards the top end of League One as well and can be. Uh, I think right now, I think the better comparison for Stevenage is Newport and not just the fact that, you know, Lenny Lawrence guiding Michael Flynn and then goes in at Stevenage. But I do think there's parallels there and I think the very, very similar personality types, Mike Flynn and Alex Ravel, um, in not necessarily, which might surprise people because because Flynn can be really intense and really like you, you don't want to get on the wrong side of him kind of way, whereas Alex Ravel's nice guy, you know, who you, you, you know, you, you feel like you'd you've known him all your life after you've met him for five minutes, kind of thing. Um, uh, but they're very similar managers. I think the way that they think about the game, the way they approach the game, the way they never get too far ahead of themselves, are very in the moment very ad- happy with high stakes, adrenaline, all those kinds of things. Mike Flynn and, and Alex Ravel are very similar for me. So N- Newport are probably the better barometer for Stevenage going forward. Yeah, well, Mike Flynn, yeah. I, I must admit, I was at first, Mike, a bit scared when um, this podcast was mentioned to Mike Flynn about his approach to games earlier in the season. Um, luckily, he took it really well, but you're absolutely right. Yeah, I won't want to get on the wrong side of, of Mike Flynn. But I guess there must be a, a bit of an edge to Alex Ravel as well. You know, the intensity that he requires although he seems like a really nice guy, you still wouldn't want to get on the wrong side of him. Well, yeah, there's been occasions of temper being lost on the touchlines. I think it's more than, I think it's, I think it's one of those things. And you can say this for Mike Flynn as well. I think it's quickly forgotten. I think that, I think when you see those episodes, you know, where I think there was some touchline incidents with Alex Ravel this season, which you just don't, you see the interviews, you see the guy and you just don't imagine it. But, you know, in the moment with the adrenaline and everything that's going on, can possibly lose the plot from time to time. But I think I think it's one of those that because he's everybody knows he's a nice guy and and and, and that you know that it's going to be quickly forgotten and you move on. So nobody really this dark cloud doesn't hang over afterwards. It's like, okay, that upset him. We'll try to avoid putting ourselves in that situation again, you know, and and we move on. Yeah, hard to imagine him holding a grudge for 